In The Ultimate Irony, I'm giving a talk about a solar backup system for the home during an unscheduled power outage. All right, so how does this work? Well, let's start with a little bit of physics. The photoelectric effect is where you can convert light into, into electricity. And this is not a new discovery. A rather smart person by the name of Einstein discovered this more than 100 years ago. And so the essential idea is that power from the sun is converted to electricity. And I'll just briefly talk about solar hot water because people often get these two concepts confused. But that's not the main point of the talk. So with solar hot water, there are two different kinds of systems. There's converting heat from the sun directly to heat and water and a heat pump. So evacuated tubes are a very efficient technology for converting heat from the sun into solar hot water, but you still need an electric backup for tidy days. But the key thing here is it's heat. There's no electricity involved except for the electric backup. A heat pump is a rather different kind of device. It uses the same physics as a fridge or, or air conditioner, essentially working in reverse. Instead of storing the cold and throwing away the hot, we store the hot and throw away the cold. And this always needs electricity to work, although there is a backup element in having a large tank that can store more energy, more heat energy than you need. So if power goes off, you still get some hot water. And the heat pump can still heat water even at night, provided your electricity is working. So I won't go through all, all the detailed differences between the two, but there are choices there. The main thing I want to talk about is solar electricity generated using photovoltaics. And I will refer to photovoltaic panels rather than solar panels so as not to confuse them with the kind of device that collect heat for heating hot water. So we're going to look at a few variations involved in whether we connect to the grid or not or whether we have batteries or not. So here are our photovoltaic panels. They produce DC power. And the power you use in your home is AC power. So you have a device called an inverter that corrects the voltages and that converts the DC to AC as needed. So what is the difference between DC and AC power? DC is direct current. Either it's off or it's on. And if it's on, the voltage level pretty much stays the same. AC current, though, is alternating current and the voltage varies all the time. Why? Because we want to be able to convert between voltages efficiently. If you look at the transmission lines over the big area of the grid, those are at extremely high voltages to minimize power loss. But you don't want to have such a high voltage in the home because it would be extremely dangerous, so you need to use things called transformers that convert between voltages and with AC that's very efficient. With DC you can't use a transformer and the ways you can convert between voltages are less efficient. So AC power then instead of a constant voltage has something that looks like a sine wave where the voltage goes up to peak and then down to a much lower number and so on and it keeps repeating like that. So back to our solar power. Our photovoltaic panels convert incoming light directly to DC electricity and then the inverter converts the DC to AC at mains voltage and so let's have a look at different ways you can use this. The first is a grid tied system and that only works if ESCOM power is on. Think of it as being the same basic concept as the wind turbines outside town but it will only supply power to the grid if the grid itself is switched on and the principle is that if the grid is meant to be off you don't want to have alternative sources of power putting electricity there that could break things. So this is limited value in terms of cutting your electricity bill if you can't actually feed power into the grid, which is allowed in some parts of the world. The value of that is if you've got lots of good sunshine and you're not using it all, then you can get some money back off your electricity bill. In some parts of the world, you're even allowed to make money out of doing that. And you can't do that here for two reasons. Number one, our local substations are not designed to accept inputs from anything but the main source that feeds them. And the second thing is we don't have any way that uh, Makana can make money out of your electricity that you feed into the grid and they like making money out of electricity it's one of their few sources of income. All right, so the next alternative is to be 100% off the grid and 
to do that, you, you need to have batteries because the sun isn't always shining. And the batteries make this expensive. So do you want to do this? Well, if you are already off the grid, if you're a farmer or running some line of business that's far from the existing infrastructure, this is your only option. In town, some people might do this, but at the moment it's still quite expensive because of the number of batteries that you need. So in between is a hybrid system where you've got some battery but not enough to run permanently, so you're still connected to the grid to make up for that. And so your side of it looks as if you're connected to ESCOM, but because of the clever inverter that can switch power sources, sometimes the power is coming from the sun, sometimes from the grid, and sometimes from the battery. And this can keep going without ESCOM as long as the batteries last, even when you aren't getting good sunshine. So this is typically what you would use as a backup system. And so that's what I have in my hand, but just to complete the picture, there's one more option, a pure battery backup. In the pure battery backup, the system is charged from ESCOM and there's no sun involved, so the photovoltaic panels disappear. So this inverter is still there because the battery voltage has to be converted from DC to AC and up from the batteries, which are usually in the region of tens of volts rather than hundreds, to 240 volts, which is what you expect from ESCOM. So let's have a look at an example of a hybrid system. This is what mine looked like originally about two, three years ago. And I'll look, through, look at all the parts from the top down. But just to note, the batteries at the bottom are not the ones that I've got now. We'll get to that in a bit. So I set this up to keep internet and phones working and also because I have a rain tank water system to keep the pump working. And lights and other plugs were a bonus. That wasn't what I originally designed it for. So let's look at what goes into it. So looking from the top down, first there's an isolator switch so we can turn the solar part of the system off if we need to. And then a distribution board, which is just your standard trip switches and earth leakage, but this is specific to what is being backed up. When we go down a level in my vertical rack, here's the inverter, and this is the one that does all the smart voltage conversions and has a little control panel. When we look a bit later at some of the pictures, you can see there. And then something which allows me to switch power source, the generator label there is a bit misleading because there isn't one, it's just the people installed it wanted to stick a label that said inverter and it was too long to fit in that space. This allows me to switch the whole thing off or run off the inverter, which does smart switching between power sources or switch it straight to mains. Normally I just leave it in that position. Next down the picture is two monster fuses that go between the battery and the rest of the system. So if there's a huge power surge, I don't fry the batteries or if the batteries behave weirdly, they don't fry the rest of the system. But here were the original batteries. I had the lead acid batteries. Those are just like two fairly large car batteries, but the slight differences in design so they can take slightly more power drain without killing them. But in common with lead acid batteries, their life is limited and the more you drain them, the lower that is. So a few months back, I replaced those two by this little baby, a lithium ion battery. That's a much better technology. It's the same chemistry essentially as in portable computers and phones and so on, but a much bigger one. This particular battery is the same sort of quality as is used for backing up telecom infrastructure like uh, the cell network and so on. So slotting that in was a fairly straightforward exercise. I um, did make a few adjustments on the control panel, but you know the person who installs that for you should know how to do that. So let's have a look now at the status display on the inverter. This is what it looks like if it's running in a fairly normal mode where there isn't enough solar to run directly, so it's picking up mains power, but the solar is charging the battery. So the best case scenario is that the solar power is sufficient and we don't need to actually use mains. So that would change the picture to look something like that. Notice now there's no line connecting the, the circle, the wavy line on the left to anything else. 
The picture below that shows the photovoltaic panel feeding into the picture with a wavy line uh, on the top and some horizontal lines on the bottom. That's the inverter and you sh the battery is shown as charging. I, it looks as if there are two inverters but there's really only one in this. The picture is just a schematic diagram. It's not accurate. And the thing on the right is whatever load we've got in the system. So what that illustrates is that everything is coming from solar, possibly a bit from battery. But what happens then if uh, power goes off at night? Well, then we get a picture like this. We're running purely off the battery. And the battery is sending DC into the inverter, which is converting to AC, which then powers my lights or whatever else switched on. Let's talk briefly then of what mine covers. I mentioned before covered lights, most plugs, and the lights are generally LED with a few minor exceptions, and they all add up to less than 100 watts, which in the old system was essentially one regular light bulb, and things are so much better now. Two to four watts of LED can light, light up a whole room, depending on the size of the room. So in terms of most plugs, what did I leave out? I left out the dining room and the kitchen because that particular circuit was where high power draw things tended to be plugged in. So let's look at a few scenarios. Let's say for instance ESCOM goes off for 12 hours, hopefully during the daytime, so we can get a bit of solar or normal operation which includes load shedding, which is what it's designed for. So normally for load shedding, or when load isn't being shed, you can just ignore it. You need to worry slightly about overloading the inverter. Occasionally I've had a situation where I run the washing machine and a vacuum cleaner of a very high power model simultaneously. But for load shedding, even you don't worry too much. You tend to try to avoid your high power drawers when it's running off battery, but with the lithium ions it hardly notices. But what if ESCOM is off for 12 hours? Well, you watch for less cloudy time so the batteries are charging a bit more and do things like run the fridge off an extension cord noting that the plugs in the kitchen are not on the back. Alright, so we've got a few things for free. Uh, remembering that the original plan was to just cover the water pump uh, and the computer network and a few other things. If we're running the washing machine with solar power, the solar can be enough to run the washing machine for a while but if not, it reverts to ESCOM. So we don't have to watch that, we just get that for free. Things like computers and TV are useful to be able to run those things, not essential. The, uh, the water pump and the network and the, and the phone are, the, are real essentials. But when, if we worry about power usage and they go into standby mode, they use very little power. Alright, so what lessons can we learn from this? It's a good investment to have low power appliances and LED lights because they do cost more, but it means your backup system is cheaper. So overall, you save. The hybrid system is a good compromise. You could put in more solar power than I have. It wouldn't only mean more expense in the photovoltaics, so you would need a higher powered inverter than I have because mine can only take 600 watts of solar. But it gives me quite a good backup. I don't have to worry too much about things going off. I just wouldn't switch on things like heaters while power's off, but mostly I'd just let things run and don't have to worry. So it gives a good defense against failure. It's not all bad. You have a low environmental footprint. Your electricity bill can be a little bit low, not a lot, because I don't have enough solar power to make it much lower. And there's less reliance on municipal water. Remember that was part of the reason for putting this whole thing in, to keep my rainwater pump going. And the minimal lifestyle changes in normal use, except when you get major failures of ESCOM and municipality and then you have to start w uh, trying a bit harder to avoid draining the batteries so fast. So overall, for me this has been a big success and you know, if you can afford to put in a system like this, it's well worth it. So I hope anyone who watches this will either contact me directly with questions for local people or questions on YouTube version of this will be 